uh, welcome, Jamil. Thank you. Um, your first film, Towers of Silence, was made in 1974, am I correct? Uh, yes, 74, 75, around there, yes. Between New York and Karachi? Yes. So, Pakistan in the early to mid-1970s, what was happening and where were you? I was in New York. Um, I was working for the United Nations as a cameraman in their, their radio and visual services department, mm -hmm. mainly covering Security Council, uh, General Assembly meetings. And I got, I was very well paid, but I got so bored after six months that I resigned and um, decided to make a film. And that was when I went back to Pakistan to shoot Towers of Silence. And but you made a film just before this, The Guitarist? Uh, that, that was, a, that was a student film. That was a film I made as a student while I was at Columbia, Columbia University. Okay. So you were studying at, you were studying film at Columbia? Yes. In New York. What, what kind of work were you exposed to over there? Or what work had you been exposed to before you went to New York to study? Um, well, I'd lived in, in, in Paris and Rome and uh, as a child, so I, I, well, as a young adult and uh, so I saw a lot of European films. In, in the States, I guess I was exposed to more American mainstream films. Mm -hmm. And you'd been traveling a lot before you studied film because, am I right in thinking your father was a diplomat? Uh, my, yes, my father was in the Pakistan Foreign Service and he, uh, he had a number of postings and as Foreign Service brats, we kind of uh, where had was to he follow him. What? And where was he posted? He was posted in Paris, Rome, Switzerland, Germany, um, Moscow, Cairo. Number he had a number, a number of postings. So were you just spending your time in the cinemas of Cairo, uh, learning about <laughs> film? Well, I, at the age of fourteen, I was parachuted into a, a, a public school in in in, uh, in England, a school called Rugby, in the middle of. Uh, middle of England rugby, the, the rugby school. So, uh, so I spent a number of years here. After that, uh, I went to university here. I studied law mm -hmm. at Oxford, and I was called to the bar, mm -hmm. and then chucked it all immediately. You didn't yes, practice. I didn't practice. No, and um, went to to New York. I made my way to New York to and managed to get into Columbia. University, they had a, in the School of the Arts, where I did a master's, ma uh, master of fine arts in film filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And in your first film, Towers of Silence, uh, which we're going to watch a clip in a second, the, the action segues beautifully between New York and uh, the, the desert land uh, depicted in the film. Is this a reflection of how you were living at the time? kind of moving between well, the two, or was New York your, your home? Uh, no, New York was never my home. I was a student there, and I stayed on for a while, and uh, I mean, Pakistan has always been my home, but I've somehow I've been kind of forced to live in other places. <laughs> um, so the film, yes, is set, is set in both countries, I mean, and uh, although Pakistan is never, is not actually mentioned in the film in mm -hmm. any way, it's a, it's a very surreal, uh, it's a very personal film. It was kind of exercising my demons. <laughs> um, what kind of demons? <laughs> do you really want to know? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> if, if you're comfortable with saying. Well, I don't think this is the time to okay, discuss that. Okay, okay. After um, the bar, maybe. But, uh, and also it was an experiment in, in, in sort of film language. I mean, I was, I was sort of testing myself. And this kind of strange film <laughs> came out. Mm. And so, um, maybe for those who don't know, um, d uh, did you have any exposure to the local film scene in Pakistan when you went to Karachi to make this film? Very little. I, I, I really didn't watch uh, Pakistani films. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the films there were... There was very little experimental f films being made there. I think mm -hmm. There was just one, one man that I know of at the time called Mushtaq Gazdar. Mm -hmm. Who are you? I'm sure you. you yeah, he made a film called um, "They Are Killing the Horse." That's right. Uh, he's the only person I know. Oh, there was also um, Javed Jabbar, for that matter. Yeah, he became made. a minister, didn't he? 
He became on. a minister later on. He made a film called Beyond the Last Mountain. Mm, that was was that at the same time? Was that mid seventies? It, it was around the same time. Yeah, mm. but that was well. I, I'll say no more about mm. that film. But um, so th I mean, mine was a purely experimental. It was a, a very sort of personal odyssey. And so, I mean, you had Javid Jabbar and you had um, Mushtaq Gazda. Were these funded by NAFDEC? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, Mushtaq Gazda was m doing his own thing. Okay. Uh, Javed Jabbar was a successful uh, advertising mm -hmm. kind of magnate at the time. Uh, and uh, I th he must have financed that film, I don't think. The, mm -hmm. the Towers of Silence... At after the f when I shot the film, I completely I was very poor at the time. I ran out of money, and the the National Film Development Corporation had just started, mm -hmm. and so they helped me with the post production, mm -hmm. and then they they presented the film at film festivals. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that kind of led on to more work mm -hmm. that uh, they backed. And so, for those who don't know, um, NAFDEC was probably the only attempt, top-down attempt in Pakistan to sponsor uh, the development of kind of experimental or left-field work. It, it was quite short-lived, wasn't it? It was very short-lived, yeah. Uh, how many films were supported by it? Towers of Silence definitely was. Well, the, yes, the, the editing of Towers of Silence was supported by them. Uh, Bl the Blood of Hussein mm -hmm. was supported by them and as far as I know, that's, those are the, the two only films, because mm -hmm. there was another film in the offing, which was called Khak or Khun, okay. uh, which I don't think it ever got made. Mm -hmm. But there's a poster for it in Blood of Hussein. Well, I, I created that poster. In, f in fact, if you look carefully at the poster, it says uh, coming attraction. Mm -hmm. So it was a film that I was see. to be made by, it was sort of an inside joke, if you like. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we can watch a clip of Towers of Silence. Um, maybe you can just quickly tell me a little bit about the film and why you chose this next clip. Uh, very difficult to... I mean, I think Ali Nobel, who, mm. <laughs> who talked to us this morning, would do a far better job than me. Uh, I was very impressed by his talk. And uh, um, in fact, uh, after listening to him, I was even more impressed by, by myself. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but how, how do I, do I, I've always had trouble kind of, because mm -hmm. it's not, it's not uh, sort of a narrative film in the traditional sense, it's not a, a narrative film. Mm -hmm. um, but this but clip follows on from the last one, doesn't it? <coughs> Shown in Ali Nabil's uh, talk. Uh, yes, in, in the talk, I don't know who was here this morning, but... Um, the first part of the clip was shown this morning because mm -hmm. I was told to keep my clips short. <laughs> um, and this is follows on from the clip that you saw this morning, yes. Okay, cool. Uh, can we play the first clip, please? <laughs> so uh, the film explores uh, Zoroastrian burial rituals whereby bodies are con uh, placed on a, a tower of silence and then consumed. How did you first encounter these, uh, um, these rituals? Well, in, in uh, Karachi, there, are, there is a Tower of Silence where uh, Zoroastrians, or, or Parsis as they're known in, known in, in Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, that's where they, the dead are taken to the towers and, uh, and they are consumed by vultures. So this is something that everybody knows, uh, is aware of. Are they still used? They are, but uh, there's been a problem with the vultures. Apparently, um, the cattle have been, uh, are being given some sort of chemical mm -hmm. which they imbibe, and uh, when the vultures eat, eat uh, well, sometimes they eat diseased cattle, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been killing, killing them off. Mm -hmm. So all the vultures you see there are, are no longer there. No longer there. And, and during the shooting of this film, how was, I mean, how did you work with the vultures? Was it easy to kind of to have mm. the cast so close <laughs> to them, or was there any danger involved? Um, there's no danger as such, but it's not, you have to wait, you know, you have to wait and you have to be very patient and uh, 
wait for them to, to come and it's hot in the desert, etc. So, but uh, they're not going to attack you unless you, you go too close to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, am I right in thinking that you screened this film to Zulfikar Ali Bhutto? I did, yes. Um, when he was Prime Minister, um, in fact, I, I knew Mrs. Bhutto and she uh, spoke about this film to her husband. And he, I was invited to the to the <coughs> to the prime minister house. Um, they, they had a, he had had a little private screening room where uh, he showed the film, and um, in fact, his two younger children were there, mm -hmm. um, who probably m made no sense of it. <laughs> um, and then we had tea afterwards. Uh, he was quite sort of subdued and uh, very different to his to his public persona. And what did and he think of the film? Well, he didn't actually say what he thought of it, mm. but he, he sort of, uh, I remember he, he brought up um, um, Italian cinema and, and a, a film by Vittorio De Sica called The Bicycle, Bicycle Thief, which for some reason had made a, an impact on him. So, so he was quite the film fan. Well, looks like it, or uh, that was a film that he certainly <laughs> remembered and uh, <laughs> wanted to discuss with me. So, um, I mean, it wasn't a very long meeting, and then I, I took my leave. Wonderful. And at what point after Towers of Silence did you start thinking about working on your next film, which was a film described as an abstract essay on tyranny, uh, The Blood of a Set? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the National Film Development Corporation had helped me with uh, finishing the, the, the Towers of Silence, and they wanted to to, prom to uh, fund and promote <coughs> a kind of different kind of filmmaking. So they asked me if I would wanted to do something, and I said yes. And uh, I gave, I mean, literally gave them a one-paragraph synopsis of this film. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, it was financed. I think they, in the long run, they regretted their decision. Mm, sure <laughs> <laughs> and so the film uh, is based on the, mart uh, the martyrdom of uh, Imam Hussein, basing yes. itself on the Shia tradition of memorializing the martyrdom as a protest against injustice in the world. Yes. Um, where did you, where did you first get exposed to? Uh, the the narrative and the commemoration well, of Imam Hussein. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, most Muslims would know about it, but uh, where I, a friend of mine, I wanted to see the processions, the Muharram processions, in Karachi, and a friend of mine who's Shia, I asked him if he would if he would take me, and he agreed, and we sort of dressed up in black, and we we went there, and I was so impressed by the the fervor and the passion mm -hmm. and then he kind of went into the details of the story and uh, that's where it all started in my in my head um, and so I took that story and I transposed it to a modern context um, the modern context of Pakistan mm -hmm. um, and so if not to watch two clips in short succession, I think we should watch uh, the next clip of uh, Blood of Hussein. Can you give sure. us a little introduction to uh, why you chose this one? Um, well, this is a clip that uh, probably a lot of people have seen. It's, uh, it's the, the white stallion, mm -hmm. uh, Imam Hussein's white stallion that comes back looking for a, for a new rider. I mean, that's the, the symbolic uh, symbolism of it. Um, someone who will pick up the mantle and, and continue the struggle against oppression. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a dramatic uh, um, sequence. Mm, because the riderless horse, the white riderless horse, uh, is a very potent symbol during the processions. Yes. Isn't it? It's, yes. it's one of the most em emotive moments yeah. when the Zuljana comes out. Yeah. Uh, so if we can watch the next clip, please, of Blood of Hussein. <laughs> So the film follows um, uh, a military coup in Pakistan, um, which the film would uh, um, would foretell, in, in a sense, one that would happen uh, two months after the filming um, finished. Um, so without knowing of the martial law era that would come, of Zia al Haq, who was about to take power in a coup, was there was there a feeling that martial law was never really 
far away? Well, the the army is always there in the background, but uh, I mean, people say that this film was prescient, and that I'm I mean, I'm not a fortune teller. I, I um, it's a story that I told, and as it happened, there, there was a, a coup one month after the shooting of the film. Um, so, uh, I mean, I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't predict that. It was, it surprised me as much as anybody else. Um, and um, am I right in thinking that before the actual coup that the film would prefigure, that you were accused of subversive activities during the making of it? Well, not during the making of it, but just afterwards, just before the coup, okay. only a month before the coup, when I, I'd finished the shoot, and um, the someone, well, the script, the screenplay, got into the hands of uh, of General Tikka Khan, who was the uh, I think he was the defense minister at the time. Mm -hmm. um, he's otherwise known as the butcher of Bengal, Tikka Khan, mm. General Tikka Khan, um, and he read it and felt that it uh, it he felt that it portrayed the army in a bad light. Mm -hmm. So instructions were given to have my passport impounded. And um, so they took it away. Mm -hmm. And for two years, I was kind of s stuck in Pakistan. I couldn't get out. The film, I'd sent the film to London for processing. So, so the film was out of the country. Sim film was out of the country. They, you know, they tried to get me to give it back to them. I mean, a lot of pressure was put on me. Um, but I refused, and then and I tried to uh, solve the problem. Uh, after the coup, uh, the first order for was was for a period of three months, and then when I went approached the once the three months had elapsed, I then approached the government and uh, went to see uh, the interior minister, who then handed me another order, <laughs> which was indefinite. So tried very hard to talk to the bureaucracy, but. Um, it was like talking to a wall. I mean, not, it couldn't uh, make any headway. And ultimately, after two years, I, I left the country. I managed to leave the country through the back door. What were you doing during these uh, few years when your passport was impounded? You were in a kind of liminal state in Pakistan. What were you doing? Well, my name had been struck off the, f the, the film producers. The, there was a sort of a registration that one had to have. Um, my name was struck off. so. Without being on on that list, you you couldn't buy film stock. Mm -hmm. So I started making commercials. Okay. And uh, friends of mine, filmmaker friends of mine, would kind of lend me a thousand feet of film every so often, and which would enable me to to make commercials and uh, earn my living mm -hmm. <laughs> for that for that period of time. Do you still have these commercials? I do. Yes. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll see them one day. Maybe, but they're, you know, they're <laughs> very old now. Um, so, as the title tells us, the opening title, or the closing title, um, one month after completion of the shooting of the film, the armed forces took over. Mm -hmm. So your passport was impounded, you managed to see, uh, send the unedit unedited material out of the country. Yeah. Um, and how did you yourself get out eventually? Well, I went out through, through Afghanistan. Um, I went to Peshawar, you know, dressed up as a Pathan and took a bus from uh, from Peshawar to Kabul through the Khyber Pass. Which was the easier in those days, wasn't it? Yeah. Had the war so. started, the Soviet-Afghan war, or was that? It was just beginning. It was just beginning. It was just starting as I uh, as I got to Kabul. Okay. And you completed editing here in the UK. Yes. Um, what was the process like working with all of that new information in mind? regarding how prescient the film had been. Um, did, did anything change in the editing? I think the only addition that I made was uh, th at the beginning of the film there's a speech. I on, the on the radio, I recreated Ziaul Haq's speech to the nation, you know, pro promising free and fair elections mm -hmm. within whatever it was, 90 days. Mm -hmm. uh, I added that speech. I mean, I got an actor to, to, uh, to, to, to recreate imitate the speech, him. yeah, mm -hmm. to imitate him. And I think that's the only addition. And how and where was the film uh, released and premiered? And how was it circulated? Did it get any uh, theatrical distribution? 
Yes, it did. It was it was first premiered at Cannes at the, at the um, it was selected for the director's fortnight at Cannes. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of an interesting story because uh, my my brother at the time he was in the foreign service and um, he happened to be posted in 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 Paris in France. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was he was uh, chargé d'affaires because there was no ambassador there at the time. And the Pakistan government instructed him to approach the director's fortnight and get the film stopped. So <laughs> he was uh, put in a rather <laughs> awkward position. <laughs> he probably hated me for it at the time. Um, and so he did. He had to literally approach them and say that the Pakistan government objects to this film. Would you please not show it? Did the lobbying work? The, the, no, the directors fortnight said, well, we don't, <laughs> we're, we're not subject to the dictates of the Pakistan government. Amazing. Um, everywhere I've read that the film remains unofficially banned in Pakistan. Um, but do you know much about how the film continues to circulate or is known about? Well, I suppose unofficially banned, it was, I mean, it was never submitted to the censor board no. because that was a non-starter. So I suppose that's why people say unofficially banned. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, in Pakistan, it was it was circulated on uh, VHS. I mean, people there were pirated copies that were circulated. Um, I mean, today you can see just about anything, uh, any pirated film. Um, and uh, now the BFI is <laughs> is going to release it on on Blu-ray, mm -hmm. so it'll be even more av available. <laughs> it'll be pirated again. I'm sure you'll find it in in the. In the shops, you know, the, the the video shops in Pakistan will, I'm sure, will have the new version before <laughs> before you can blink. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, so, after Blood of Hussein, you're in the UK and you're unable to go back to Pakistan. Well, I was unable to go back for ten for was, was ten years that mm -hmm. uh, Zia was in was uh, was there was in power. So, what new work is in the pipeline in the early 80s, just after Blood of Hussein? Uh, well, in the early 80s, uh, Channel 4 had just started, mm -hmm. and uh, in those days they were doing a lot of experimental work. I mean, they were more open to sort of off offbeat films. Very different to how they yeah, are now. Very different to how they are, they are now, yeah. And uh, David Rose was the commissioning editor, drama commissioning editor, and I, I screened The Blood of Hussein for him. Okay. And he said, do you want to do something else? I said, yes. Wonderful. And... Um, so I, the uh, um, Born of Fire came out of that uh, relationship. Uh, I, I mean, I ex gave him an idea, which you, the Channel 4 helped me to develop it, and then I shot it in, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. How did you pitch the film? I've always, would, I've always wondered how that film could be <laughs> summed up into one or two sentences. Not to put you on the spot here. <laughs> I you know, honestly can't remember, but it's, uh, in those days you didn't have to do a lot of pitching because they were, they were very open to, to uh, independent filmmakers. I mean, today you could never make that film. It would be impossible. And, and you, know, you have to go through 50 hoops today to, you know, to even get through the door. Of course. So the next clip we're going to watch is of Born of Fire. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this next clip? Uh, yeah, the next clip... In fact, again, it's, uh, you saw the first, uh, those who were here this morning saw the first part of the clip. And this is the continuation. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, battle, it's a sort of musical battle mm -hmm. between the master musician and um, the character that Peter Firth plays, mm -hmm. the, the, the flautist. Nabil Shaban also plays in that sequence, mm -hmm. and he, he's a formidable actor mm -hmm. um, who's disabled but has... has uh, uh, despite his, disab his uh, disabilities, if that's the right word, has uh, uh, you know has done an extraordinary performance in this film, which you'll see. So that's that's what this scene is all about: the the, the battle between good and evil. Wonderful. Uh, can we play the next clip, please? <laughs> so, uh, as with uh, Towers of Silence and Blood of Hussein, uh, Born of Fire is very rich in spectacular set pieces. And the film has been described as one of the strangest and most esoteric of the 1980s. Uh, what inspired you to make this film? Oh, um, what inspired me? I guess we, uh, as children we were told, uh, told stories of jinns, uh, which are sort of creatures of fire that can take on 
human and animal shape and uh, capable of good and evil. So it's kind of sparked, th that sparked off the, the story of this film. Mm. Um, you know, they're sort of kind of horror stories, if you like, and, uh, and this kind of it grew into this strange film. <laughs> and um, in this film, I noticed there's a kind of a distinct sense that music can be an interface to other worlds. And uh, I think I learned, I learned for the first time in uh, Arlene Beale's talk that um, you were a flamenco guitarist? Well, I, 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 I mean, I, I studied flamenco for a long time um, with Paco Peña, who was the, um, with whom I collaborated to make the, the film that's showing this afternoon called Passover. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could never reach the heights that Paco re reached because I, and I also started quite late in life. But um, I became quite obsessed by it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've also learned a lot of things from Ali Nobil <laughs> about my work. I think we all have. Um, and so gathering information, gathering footage for this film led to your next film, Calf. Is that correct? Uh, yes. How did that well, come about? I was looking for, for volcano footage. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I went to the libraries, etc., and there wasn't very much available. And I was visiting a friend in Mauritius um, who, uh, who told me when I was going back to England, he said there's an island just south of Madagascar with, where there's an active volcano. Mm -hmm. um, you should stop off on your way back to London. And I did. As one does. As one does, <laughs> yeah. And I met um, I met a volcanologist there who lived on the island. And as I was leaving, I sort of jokingly said, uh, if there's a, an eruption, give me a call. Mm -hmm. So a little while later, I was asleep uh, here in London, and I get a call in, in the middle of the night from him saying uh, the volcano is erupting. <laughs> so I grabbed a camera and uh, flew, to, flew back there and... Again, as one does. As one does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and got some such extraordinary footage uh, of that volcano that uh, I then persuaded... Um, well, apart from the stuff that I used in, in Born of Fire, I used a few shots in Born of Fire, I put the rest together and persuaded Channel 4 to commission it. To commission it. Mm -hmm. And so how were you shooting, Calf? Were you in a helicopter? How, how close did you get to the... Lava and oh, very close. I mean, some there's very little, there's a little bit shot from a helicopter, but most of it was from the ground. Mm -hmm. So you lose. So you are using like quite a long lens, or did you get uh, using an average sort of zoom lens? I mean, we didn't have any sort of telescopic lenses, if that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. And this again was commissioned or funded by Channel Four. <coughs> it was. It was commissioned after it was shot. Okay. I, I put you know I put the footage together and then showed it to. Um, to one of the commissioning editors who then commissioned it and I then edited it and it, it became a Channel 4 production. So this was for, for television? Was it for a particular series? No, it was for television. It was, um, I forget what she was. She was the commissioning editor for ecology or some such thing. Mm -hmm. I forget what her exact title was. And the music used is um, Tangerine Dream, Klaus Schultz, Popover. Were you listening to this at the time? Um, I must have been because I mean the music it wasn't composed for the film it was existing music that um, that fitted the film very well so I, I, I you know I laid laid the music to the film mm -hmm. and then approached them and they they agreed to to use it a different time yeah different time so uh, and the interplay of image and music uh, drove your next film Passover which as you dis as you said was a um, collaboration between you and your teacher, Papa yeah, Pena. Yeah. How did that come about? Um, well, that was a, a sort of a competition, if you like. It was um, the BBC and the Arts Council uh, wanted four films made, uh, a series of four films made, which would be collaborations between composers and uh, filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I approached Paco and asked him whether he would be happy to collaborate. He agreed. Um, I submitted this project, and this was one of the four films that was selected. Wonderful. Yeah. What was the nature of your um, collaboration? How does a composer work with a filmmaker in that way? 
Oh gosh, uh, that's, uh, I mean, there's so many different ways of working with a composer, but, uh, well, I mean, first of all, there was a script that we were working to, so he was composing specific music for the different scenes in the, in the, in the film. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, we kind of worked on it together, and uh, that's what came about. And the story follows um, the legend that gypsies forged the nails used in the crucifixion. Yes. And where is the footage shot? Is it in Spain? It's, it's all shot in Cordoba in Spain, okay. yeah. Entirely shot in Cordoba. Uh, and can you describe this next clip which you've chosen from Passover? This is a scene of uh, a c the crucifixion, if you like. It's a, I mean, the film is a sort of a passion play, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of modern, <laughs> modern passion play, and um, this is the scene where uh, where Jorge, who's here, I think, uh, Jorge de Juan, he's there, who plays the lead. <laughs> he's sitting in the middle of the theater there, um, where he's, he's crucified. Okay. Yeah. So uh, can we have the next clip, please? So uh, as with your second film, Blood of Hussein, there's a real fascination here with religious and ritual procession and its proximity to everyday life. Uh, what turned your attention in this film to Catholicism and uh, Judaism? Um, well, I've always been interested in Christianity and Judaism. I mean, Judaism, uh, both Christianity and Judaism are, are derived, from, uh, both Christianity and Islam are derived from Judaism. Um, my mother was a Catholic. Mm although she wasn't, she didn't practice. Mm -hmm. So all the influences were there in my childhood. Now it might be fair to say that your career in the 1980s was bookended on either end by the ascendancy of Zia al Haq, and then one might say his descendancy, his death in a plane crash right. um, in 1988. So did this, did this change of regime give you a chance to return to Pakistan? Yeah, after, after Zia was killed, um, I was able to go back to Pakistan. And again, I, I made a, I was, got Channel 4 to commission a new film, which was called Immaculate Conception, mm -hmm. which was set in Karachi. Um, it's about uh, an Anglo-American uh, couple uh, who are working out there. The hu husband is working out there. Uh, he's a working in a world wildlife organization. The wife uh, is desperate to have a child. And they, somebody tells her, a friend of hers tells her that there's a shrine which is run by transgenders, mm -hmm. uh, what are known as hij hijras in, in Pakistan. I'm not sure whether that's a derogatory, because you were saying it's a derogatory term. I've heard from some people that the term now used is um, Khawaja Sarah. But I'm not sure. Right. Okay. Um, well, I anyway, some discussion transgenders who mm -hmm. uh, and the the shrine had a, a reputation for curing infertility. Mm -hmm. So we were making a, do a doc. I was making a documentary on shrines, mm -hmm. and um, well, I travelled all over Pakistan, uh, visiting various shrines mm -hmm. and doing my research, and I came across a shrine that was uh, that it was run by. Trans transgenders, mm -hmm. and the uh, the saint that was buried there was called Gulab Shah, which loosely translated means uh, um, the Rose King, mm -hmm. and um, so that's what sparked off this idea. And I came back to London, and um, Channel Four agreed to finance a feature. And what happened to that footage that you were making? for the documentary. Does that still exist? I think I have it somewhere, but uh, I've never revisited it. It would be lovely to see it. Yeah. So um, what's this next clip you've chosen from uh, Immaculate Conception? Uh, what have I chosen? Oh, it's a clip where the, 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 uh, the hijras come, come and uh, after the, the child is born, mm -hmm. they normally come and sing and dance outside the, the house of the, of the woman who's, who's, uh, who's had the child. Mm -hmm. and. People give them money to basically to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the sequence. So can we watch the next clip, please? <laughs> so this was filmed at the onset of the Gulf War. Did that affect production in any way? 
Uh, yes, it did. It did. We had lots of problems then because we, I had uh, American actors, British actors, the British crew, and uh, their embassies were telling them not to go out and to stay in the indoors, etc. So we had to. Um, there are many days we couldn't shoot, mm -hmm. and five of my crew got on the next plane and left because they were worried about their safety. Um, this caused a problem with the schedule because um, Shabana Azmi, the, one of the actresses who plays in the film, uh, had was uh, doing was go going to Calcutta to do City of Joy. Okay. So she had to leave, and I hadn't finished finished uh, her, her shoot, etc. So there were a lot of lot of reper repercussions caused by the, the Gulf War. Yeah. Mm. And there's a great scene in the film uh, shot in a synagogue in Karachi. Does that still exist? That space? Do you know? Can I tell you a secret? Please do. The synagogue, the interior of the synagogue was actually not in Karachi. Oh, okay. <laughs> but there was a synagogue in Karachi. There was recently. one, but uh, I tried to find it mm. and couldn't really, unless you know of one. No, I haven't been to Karachi yet. Um, but no, I couldn't really find a synagogue in Karachi. I mean, mm. there must have been one once upon a time. Yeah, or, there was one, I think. Um, but um, no, this was this was actually <laughs> filmed somewhere else. Um, and your next film, Jinnah, mm. um, this follows the life of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, considered yeah. the political founder of Pakistan, uh, telling one man's role in the birth of Pakistan and the bloodshed that, that followed the partition of India. Yeah. It was your biggest project to date. How did it come about? Well, I was actually approached by uh, an academic from Cambridge. Uh, who was trying to make a, who wanted to make a film <laughs> on, on on Jinnah mm -hmm. for the 50th an anniversary of partition, which would have been in 97. Uh, 97, yeah. Mm -hmm. Had he'd raised some of the money. His name was Akbar Ahmed. Mm -hmm. He'd raised some of the money, but not all of it. Um, which was why the film wasn't uh, wasn't finished on on time. Mm -hmm. We fell out big time, incidentally, oh. <laughs> uh, he and I. Why? It's a long story. I'm not going to go into it. Too long. Okay. <laughs> Can you explain but, uh, for people who aren't familiar with Jinnah the kind of the presence and the importance of the man to Pakistan? Uh, yeah. Well, he's almost beyond reproach, isn't he? He's beyond reproach. I mean, you see, you know, he's on every every banknote, every every. Uh, Every wall and every office. In fact, it was um, casting Christopher Lee was it was actually uh, turned out to be a big problem because um, I needed an actor who looked like Jinnah because everybody knows everybody in Pakistan knows what he looks like. And um, when I suggested Christopher Lee, I was told that you can't possibly cast Dracula mm -hmm. as the father of the nation. So. Um, so then I started looking for other actors, but couldn't find anyone who looked like him, mm -hmm. uh, except for one uh, one actor who was a sort of amateur actor. Uh, my production manager sent me a, a, an audition of this man, mm -hmm. and yes, he looked a lot like Jinnah, but he was didn't have the kind of stature that I, I wanted. I wanted uh, someone who was larger than life, mm -hmm. and. Um, so I said, thank you, but no thank you. And uh, he turned out to be the editor of a major Pakistani newspaper. The actor who? The, the actor who wanted to play Jinnah. Okay. And, um, and uh, he then started a campaign against uh, the film in his, in his newspaper. Oh. Uh, he was being extremely vindictive about not being cast. And... Um, he, I mean, he sort of put pictures of pictures of Christopher Lee with fangs on the front page, saying uh, Dracula cast as father of the nation. Um, and how did that go down in Pakistan? Well, it didn't. I mean, he went as far as saying that um, uh, Salman Rushdie had written the script. Had he? Uh, uh, no, of course not. <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> would, would have been the kiss of death of the project. Of um, and. Um, uh, as a result, we, I mean, we still went ahead. Um, we had to put bodyguards outside the actors, you know, the actors' uh, hotel rooms. Not bad. 
Well, we were taking precautions because if, you know, someone came and took a pot shot at Christopher Lee, that would have been, uh, would have been a shame. disastrous. Um, and we also had an Indian actor, uh, Shashi Kapoor, Kapoor. etc. But anyway, we, we got through all that and uh, managed to finish the film. But one of the repercussions was, was that the, the government, uh, they were going to put a th third of the budget, put up a third the of the Pakistani budget. The Pakistani government? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and they pulled out. Okay. So that caused other problems. Mm. So um, did you imagine the end product being different, longer, if you'd have had the funding to do more? Well, the end product would have been longer because we had a, a strand in the film um, mm. where, I mean, a sort of rather surreal strand where Jinnah uh, travels in time and meets um, uh, modern, uh, modern Muslim leaders and mm. has sort of discussions with them, etc. So that, that whole strand, I was unable, to, I, I couldn't shoot that and I had to cut it out of the film. I had to take it, go and take it out completely. I mean, actually, the finished film was, was a lot weirder than it, than it is. <laughs> weirder? Weirder in the sense that it was more surreal and mm -hmm. more, uh, I mean, there is a surreal strand in it at the moment with the angel uh, who takes him back through his life. Mm -hmm. But with this other strand, it would have been even sort of, <laughs> I pushed it even further. Hey, Shall we watch the clip from Jinnah? So this weekend retrospective of your works, your early works, finishes with Jinnah. Um, yeah. But could you tell us about the many films you've made since then? Uh, after that, I made a film called Infinite Justice, which is based on the, the Daniel Pearl story, the American journalist who mm -hmm. was uh, beheaded in Karachi. On camera. Yeah. Um, then I made a film called God Forsaken, which mm -hmm. was uh, it's about an angel who's given a child to protect, and instead of protecting that child, he kills it because he knows that when the child will grow up, he'll be responsible for the deaths of thousands. Mm -hmm. And so he loses his wings, and then he has to, he's comes down to earth, and he has to regain his wings. Um, what else did I do? Uh, a film called Seven Lucky Gods which is about an Albanian immigrant who uh, infiltrates the life, lives of a group of Londoners mm -hmm. and the consequences. Uh, I mean, it has a, I suppose it has a pedophilia theme in it. Mm -hmm. um, those are the three features I made. And then I made a short film when I was in, in Karachi recently. I, I, uh, I've been teaching. I've been teaching at a, at a university for the last three, four years. Teaching film, I imagine. Teaching film, yeah. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, I made another shor uh, a short film about, um, it was to, uh, to show my students how films, films were made. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it was kind of a throwaway film, but it turned out a little better than I expected. Um, it's based on the uh, Raymond Davis story, the... Uh, the contractor. The, yeah, con the contractor who was... Um, who killed a couple of uh, muggers and who in was Lahore. Uh, in Lahore, yes. And um, the American government had to pay quite a large sum of money, to, of blood money, to mm -hmm. get him released. So it's based on that story. I mean, it's a reinvention of that story. And are you working on anything right now? Or uh, anything in the pipeline? Well, I'm, I, there's a film I want to make. I haven't got all the money for it yet. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> are you looking at uh, <laughs> the funders, audience? perhaps, yeah. in the audience? <laughs> uh -huh. Um, it's a gangster film set in Karachi, mm -hmm. so that's the next thing I want to do. Okay, is it for the local market? It, it's for the local market. It's mm -hmm. in Urdu. I mean, it's a it's a completely Urdu film with with uh, Pakistani actors. I mean, there's no foreign element in it at all. Because there's a new wave of filmmaking going on right now in Pakistan, yeah. which is trying to kind of turn its back on the traditional, yes, more yes. formulaic yeah. mode associated with Lollywood cinema. Have you seen any of these new films? What do you think? Well, I've them? seen a film called Cake, and uh, my friend Beo here is uh, <laughs> is the star, one of the stars in it. Wonderful. And she gives a great performance. I think she's the best thing in it. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have high hopes for, um, for Pakistani cinema? Do you see a, a sea change? Well, I'd like to think so. Um, the, the, it's, ha it's hard to tell because there, there aren't enough cinemas there. And um, 
these independent films, if they don't make their money back, then you know they, they don't get a second chance. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens. I, it's hard to predict. Mm -hmm. So we finished in perfect time to be able to open up the floor to a Q&A. Well, my, my, the scripts, my scripts have become, uh, I guess, in, in the earlier work, the, the, sc <coughs> the screenplays are much less developed. I, I, the, the imagery is uh, much more dependent on the imagery. Because um, I didn't know how to write a script, I guess. I was <laughs> not very experienced at the time. And, uh, uh, and I, when I look back at my films, I, I can see that perhaps the script writing is the, uh, is, is the weaker element in the film. But one thing I do know is until I find a central image in the film, uh, it's not there for me. I mean, I need to find one central image from which everything grows. If, the, if a scene doesn't work for me visually, uh, you know, I, it doesn't, uh, I'm not happy. It needs to, and you know, an, an image will will tell uh, a lot more than you know a long, complicated dialogue scene. If you can say it in an image, I think you'll be much more successful. Well, I'm always t I'm always told uh, people tell me why don't you make a film about Pakistan that's positive? You can't project Pakistan by making bland films. I mean, I think Pakistan, the Pakistan's artists, filmmakers, are the best ambassadors for Pakistan. Not not the people you've got sitting in the in the uh, in the uh, embassies and high commissions. I hope there's no one here from there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know how an artist has to be free to to criticize to. Uh, to make films that show different aspects of society, it doesn't mean that uh, if, if you make a film in Pakistan about, say, a drug addict, that doesn't mean that the that the, it's a nation of drug addicts. I, I don't know why we're so sensitive uh, about taking on a topic that, uh, that is controversial. I've written a script for a, a, a gangster film now. Uh, you yeah. know, the thing is that, that. that in, in America, if you made a gangster film or, or you know, if you made a film about Al Capone or, or, or the, the Godfather, nobody's going, you know, nobody thinks twice about it. In Pakistan, if you start touching a subject like that, everybody says, oh, why are you, you know, why are you uh, projecting Pakistan as a country of gangsters? I'm not. I'm just proje projecting, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's a story about one element of the country. It doesn't represent the country. This is where we, we, we're, too, we're, we're oversensitive. I enjoyed teaching my students. I enjoyed my relationship with my students. Uh, I did learn something. I learned that the academic world is, is, a, is a filthy world <laughs> and uh, full of uh, backbiting and uh, comp it's competitive. It's that side of it I didn't like at all. Um, I guess I, I'm, you know, the, the other thing I didn't care about the academic world was that they spend a lot of time, a hell of a lot of time in, in meetings and, and where they talk in circles and nothing gets done. And as a filmmaker, I just couldn't stand it because uh, making a film, you, you, you know, you're, you, you've got, uh, there are time constraints. The, the the sun is setting, and you've got to make a decision. You've got to get the, get it done. There, they just go round and round, and nothing gets decided. So that was one side of the academic world that I just didn't fit into. I'd like to thank Jamil once again for joining us on stage. It's been wonderful to have him here. Thank, thank you.